remote work doesn't need to mean that it's lonely work. We confuse remote work with isolation a lot because we equate remote work with working from home. Again, because the pandemic forced remote work to be synonymous with working from home. But post-pandemic, there are countless ways to work remotely. You are listening to episode 40 of the Happy Space podcast. Today, we're exploring remote work 2.0 and the opportunity to work at your neighbors with Radius founder, Amina Moreau. Welcome to the Happy Space podcast, where productivity meets inclusivity and everyone gets things done. Hello, I'm Claire Kumar, highly sensitive executive coach, speaker, and your host. Studies show that diversity leads to better business outcomes. So doesn't it make sense to invite everyone's richest contribution? Yet too many people are invited to burn out or opt out, and we are squandering talent. On this show, we'll explore a two-part solution. Part one, cultivating sustainable performance, the individual design of work and life to preserve our energy so we can keep contributing. And two, designing inclusive performance, the design of spaces, cultures, products, and services which invite the richest participation. I hope you enjoy these conversations and find inspiration and encouragement for everyone deserves a happy space. What if you see yourself as a chronic entrepreneur who wants to make a difference in the world? You notice that people want more flexibility. They're starved for social connection. At the same time, the planet will be better off if you get cars off the road. Given that the commute is the biggest barrier to the return to office, why not eliminate the commute? Well, that's exactly what my next guest, Amina Moreau, thought. And the result is Radius. It's a company she's founded to help you have your home office away from home, but not so far away. She's thinking neighborhoods and neighborhoods are the glue, the the part of our life that has been neglected as we've all been commuting to larger centers when in fact we can have a rich life next door, down the street, close by. So Radius is an opportunity to think about working differently, connecting locally, and bringing members of an organization together in smaller local hubs. Amina is a fellow Canadian, fellow tennis player, and creator of several companies, including five-time Emmy award-winning Still Motion Inc., and sway storytelling. Amina has a love of using the story to sway opinion and to invite you to think a little bit differently. Please enjoy today's episode. And if you have questions, uh, reach out to us on social media, find us on LinkedIn. You'll find the links in the show notes as always. And let us know what you thought. And uh, I'm curious, is working in your neighbor's office or back garden shed or Airstream uh, something for you? Take a look at uh, radius.pro and uh, let us know what you think. Welcome, Amina. So good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to talk to you because as soon as I heard about Radius, I was really excited because... For one, I've thought that there has to be this rekindling of connection to local community, and we need to be together at work. And I thought, wow, Radius has solved this. I'd I'd love for you to share with our listeners a little bit about how you got to the idea to found this company that's that's really going to help people come together around work in local spaces. Sure. I am a big proponent of remote work and having flexibility, having freedom. I think people do their best work when they have a sense of autonomy and that there is an underlying level of trust among teammates and leadership. And that is really what Radius was founded around. So in mid-2020, When we were all forced into lockdowns because of the pandemic, we're at the beginning of what would become 
what I consider a paradigm shift in the way that we do work. We were all forced to work from home. And at the time, working from home and remote work were synonyms because the home was the only place that you could remote work from. But as the end of 2020 rounded the corner and the beginning of 2021 started inspiring, perhaps the end of a pandemic, vaccines were starting to come out. People were th- were thinking about what it might be like to be together again. My team and I started talking to companies about what they care about in this new normal. Mm. And while mitigating distractions at home and the sorts of feelings of burnout that can hit somebody after a while of working from home and not being able to separate work from life. The blurred lines. Yep. It's it's so blurred. Yeah. What we were finding in talking to HR professionals, people ops, chief operating officers, what companies cared about over and above everything else was how to get people together again if they no longer had an office, if they went entirely remote, or Mm -hmm. if they went partially remote and people either didn't really want to go back to the office or maybe the office was now too small for their teams, et cetera. How do we get back together in person again in a way that feels organic, it doesn't feel forced, Mm -hmm. and is cost-effective? And that was one of the biggest reasons that we ended up launching Radius was because it's not just companies that want this. A lot of employees do too. I love working from home. I much prefer actually working from home than from an office. And as an introvert, I work better in solitude than in big groups. But not everybody is like that. Mm -hmm. And even us introverts benefit from being in person with colleagues from time to time to deepen those relationships in a way that is hard to do over Zoom. And so by founding Radius, what we created was a network of distributed workspaces Mm. that are right in employees' neighborhoods. If you look at national statistics, the biggest barrier to returning to the office is the commute. And so what if there were beautiful, unique, private workspaces just down the street from your house where you could get that work-life separation maybe once a week or however often you need it and see other colleagues that might live within a certain reasonable radius of where you are. Mm. So that was hence that. the term, hence the term radius. Yeah. Um, exactly. What have you found in terms of who's using it and what this reasonable radius is. Have you come up with some learning and insights as to what's tolerable and what people are really happy to travel? It really depends on the jo- on the geography. Mm. So the tolerance for commuting is very different, for example, in Portland, Oregon, than it is in LA or in San Francisco. Or Toronto. You know? or, or in Toronto. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right? You know, when I lived, yeah. I lived in Mississauga, uh, but had lions sometimes in Niagara on the lake or vice versa. Uh, We did both. And I mean, that was an at least an hour commute each way. Right. And for some people that used to be normal on a day to day basis pre pandemic Mm -hmm. in Portland, if you have to drive more than eight minutes, you kind of roll your eyes a little bit. Really? I have to go that far. (laughs) And so the tolerance is a little bit different because, um, you know, it's all relative. But in general, Our biggest goal is to take cars off roads, to reduce commute times, not just to give people their lives back, but also Mm -hmm. to reduce carbon emissions and to give people not just one space that they can go to, but a network of spaces so that maybe if they're getting together with a colleague on this side of the city this week, but maybe getting together with three colleagues that live on the other side of the city the following week, that you don't don't have to just be stuck with one. And in fact, you can have access to various neighborhoods and also different sizes and capacities of spaces with different amenities based on 
what you're doing because maybe one day you're just working one on one with a colleague and you're just doing heads down work but maybe the next week you're doing a presentation and you need AV equipment for example mm-hmm. and maybe a, a more seating and so yeah. it's nice to have that flexibility and that's hard to do with a traditional office you can't really flex up and down yeah it's especially with the way they've been designed traditionally perhaps more as they're thinking about flexibility in office design there'll be some uh, ability to do that. But the model of having everybody come to an urban center does drive up a lot of commuting energy and um, climate climate ecology impact. Um, I'm loving hearing this. What's the response in the market to this, the, the side and vote, uh, you know, giving a vote for the environment here? What are, what are you yeah. hearing that? Is that, it, does that, I'm not hearing a lot of that when I'm hearing re- re- uh, return to office mandates. I think the environment is just we're ignoring it. So how is it playing into your discussions with leaders and the value that they're seeing in this? Yep. Well, for those companies who clearly have a genuine desire to reach ESG goals, for them, it is a priority. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of companies, they're looking for ways to save money right now. We're in a tough economic climate. And so if they can save money on real estate, on rent, then then why not? It makes so much more sense. If your people are using your office on a variable variable basis to pay for it on a variable basis, most office leases are a fixed cost and you're on the hook to pay for it regardless on how often people are using it. But if people are only using it once or twice a week, then does it really make sense to pay for it seven days a week? Probably not. And so for those companies who, you know, for for whom it's a nice to have, to have environmental savings, oh, okay, you know, we check a box for them. But most companies right now, they care about trimming costs Mm -hmm. and also about retention of their top talent because that also costs them a lot of money Mm -hmm. and it saves a lot of time. And, you know, who wants to lose their top people, right? Well, And and so we help with that. And this is one of the issues that's come up is that all of these conditions actually are independent of someone's talent level in the company. So you could lose your best performer over the commute. Yes, absolutely. Because statistically, it is the biggest barrier to returning to the office. And most offices, like you were saying, are in city centers. Even most co-working spaces tend to be in city centers. Mm -hmm. And so even for those companies who are already dabbling in the flex office space solution set, Mm -hmm. most of their options tend to also be downtown. And most people simply don't live downtown. They live in the suburbs. And so that's a big reason that we're focused on bringing great workspaces to the suburbs, because that's frankly where people live. Yeah. So I'm thinking of an organization. Help me connect to organizations who may have an, let's take Toronto as an example, because I know you know it as well. So Mm -hmm. say, you know, the organization has been uh, particularly Toronto centric, but the people are spread out all over the six and beyond, right? Yep. How does it work then? Is it activity based and someone's going to be a champion and a leader for that activity and, you know, choose a location and ask people to come to that? I'm, I'm, what I'm sensing as I imagine it is that for some people, it'll be close. There's probably other, for other people, there's going to be some traveling. How is this navigated practically when uh-huh. not everybody on a team lives close by to each other? Today's episode of the Happy Space podcast is sponsored by ClaireKumar.com. With sensitivity, curiosity, and courage, I serve three groups asking the tough questions that lead to meaningful answers. Number one, I coach ambitious leaders to design for well being and achieve next level work life integration. Number two, I mic drop thought bombs. That's BALMS as in B-A-L-M-S, in keynotes and workshops, helping organizations achieve the business imperative that is inclusivity. And three, I collaborate with brands concerned with respect for well-being on product design, marketing, and PR. 
If any of this piqued your interest, come find me at clairekumar.com. I'd love to speak with you. Designing inclusive performance together will lead to the richest results. It's a great point. And it's it's not always going to be foolproof. Sometimes there is going to be that, you know, one person that lives on the other side of, of town and it's less convenient for them. And that's why some people make the argument that downtown is the best place to have an office because it's centrally located. And so it's equally convenient for everyone. I would argue that that makes it equally inconvenient <laughs> for everyone. Is it half full or half empty? Right. So the way that I look at it is that having a wide network of multiple workspaces is always going to give you more choice, more optionality than just having one fixed solution. And it allows you to flex based on your needs. So to your point, yes, absolutely. It is based on activity, it's based on need. Some companies are using our spaces simply to have people together in one room, but still doing independent work side by side. Just just so that they can have that camaraderie. So as they're grabbing coffee from the kitchen, they might be able to pass by each other and have, have a conversation. Other companies are booking space when they have a specific meeting with uh, an agenda that they have to get through with a very, very particular audience that they want to engage. Mm -hmm. And then there are other companies who are simply booking our spaces for occasional offsites. Maybe they have an office that mm -hmm. they use fairly regularly, but they also want a change of scenery, maybe once a month, once a quarter to do some additional st strategy work or something like that. Yeah. And so in those instances, sometimes we get requests for the farthest space from town. Can we get something that's out in the woods or out by the beach so that we can really disconnect from the grind and focus on inspiration? Whereas for those cases where you're just getting five or six employees once a week to work together, perhaps meet, perhaps brainstorm, then you're looking for something that's probably as conveniently located for as many people as possible. Yeah. So it's going to be all over the place in terms of the focus, the intention, the kind of people that are coming. And it's for each organization to reflect and then look at the opportunity to provide options. I think that's what I'm hearing. This word options keeps coming up. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And I think it's so important because first of all, companies have a diversity of needs. They need space for a huge variety of reasons. But then their people also have a variety of needs and preferences, right? And I think that that diversity is a beautiful thing. We should not be instituting these one size fits all solutions and hoping because they are simple that we can just, you know, walk away yeah. and have it work. Yeah. I think we're done with simple if we're actually going to solve a lot of these challenges in in the best way possible we've talked a little bit about i have my um work style profile for individuals to identify the way they work best and the conditions of work um, and i'm wondering if you have some kind of invitation to organizations so they can start to understand the kinds of workspaces they need and start to come to you with a menu of this is what we want do you, do you, mm -hmm. how do you help them come to that? Because I'm sure there's quite a bit of self-reflection based on the tasks, the teams, the location. How do you get at that? And what kind of organizations are you working with? Maybe you can give an example of what some are doing. Yeah. Yeah. That self-reflection is so key. And there are some companies that are better at it than others, as I'm sure you have encountered as well. The, the ones who I think are already seeing themselves thrive in remote and flexible set settings are those who have a robust practice of self-reflection. Yeah. It's those who don't that are struggling the most and who are throwing their hands up into the air saying, oh, remote work doesn't work simply because they haven't figured out how to leverage it to its fullest potential. It's really just a matter of talking to them about their needs, about their goals. Sometimes they know already exactly what they need. They do offsites at this cadence and they do 
strategy meetings at that mm -hmm. cadence and they want to get their team together at yet another cadence and they a lot of times they already know but for those who don't know we start to ask questions that might not have anything to do with cadence or type of meeting at all and instead we talk about where their challenges lie with things like culture with innovation with productivity and we start to identify are these challenges real or are they simply perceived? Is there any data around it? Is it all just around gut feel and anecdotes? How robust <laughs> is the information that we're working with? Because uh -huh. there's a good chance that the solutions they think they're, they need, that they're about to spend a bunch of money on, maybe they don't at all. And they just need to start thinking about things a little bit differently. And I so, was, yeah, it's, it's like you were it's listening. Just, to, it's like you were listening to my conversation with Kate Lister about people making decisions in the absence of information, mostly on gut feel or bias or consensus effect or whatever it is, yep. right? These assumptions that are at play, but the, the yep. data is not there. Do you find any organizations? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I knew you were going to say something. So please come yep. back to that. But do you find organizations? go back and get some of the data and then come back to you and 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 they're prompted to do some of that analysis to really find out what they need i think the the good ones do the ones who truly care about it do those that are just looking for a quick fix because they're bleeding talent or there's something else going on in their organization that they they need to 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 stop a leak yeah. and they're just grasping at whatever is going to quickly stop it they're the ones that are thinking short term mm. and oftentimes those short term solutions aren't necessarily sustainable for the long term but i am encouraged that there are remote consultants there there are great resources for companies to be able to 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 learn these methodologies you don't have to reinvent the wheel although this is a new way of managing teams it existed pre-pandemic and there are wonderful resources out there. In fact, there are companies that have published all of their methodologies for the rest of us to learn from. Mm -hmm. GitLab being one of them, Atlassian is extremely vocal about how they're running their teams yeah. and it's inspiring and they are proofs of concept that it works. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's about an appetite to listen and explore uh, yeah. and then try things within their own organization. Uh, we've talked a little bit about my hypothesis that for people that have not traditionally managed a dispersed workforce, there's a reluctance to manage the increasing abstract nature of work. Just press rewind, make everybody go back to where I could see them. From, from a cognitive processing point of view, I think that is easier. And so there's a whole there's a whole skill set here that if you weren't traditionally managing dispersed workforce that is new and that people have had to figure out on their own. Yep. It's the way we've always done it. Yeah. And it's much more comfortable to go with what you know and to repeat patterns. Yeah. I mean, we're human. So yeah. I don't think we can really hold it against people. Right. But when times have significantly changed and the workforce is craving something different, at some point you've got to, you've got to listen and you have to be open to changing with the times. Those companies that aren't, I feel like there's going to be a small percentage that continues to, to survive because at the end of the day, I do think that there are some employees that also want to go back to the before times mm -hmm. and work as if it's 2019. And so I do think that there's there's something for everyone, but I do also think that the majority of the workforce wants something new, something that encompasses a whole lot more freedom than mm -hmm. the before times. And companies are going to have to adjust. And if they don't, they're going to be held back. Yeah, there's definitely going to be a loss of some talent for sure, for, for sure, because it's too important. I think my pulse on it, working with people individually, has been this newfound 
value in life that was just, there wasn't time for it because the commute took so much. So whether it was personal health or it was relationships or it was nutrition, um, there was always something that was compromised because of the amount of not just travel time, but um, preparation time. And I think a burden largely greater on women than men in terms of wardrobe, makeup, hair, all of that. Not saying there aren't guys that out there going and spending a lot on that too. Um, there's room for, for all of that. But I think the load and, and the challenge to caregiving on whom in many cases it falls on the female in the home as well, mm -hmm. um, those loads are great. And people are saying, you know what? I found a better way. I can't unsee it. <laughs> like you can't, yeah. you can't make me unsee this. So, so yeah. how are we going to dance differently? But to the point of blurry lines and feeling lonely, there was an epi ep epidemic of loneliness before the pandemic. And the pandemic yeah. just solidified and, and threw more people into it. So what are you noticing? Have you done any research or um, understood the impact of this model, which is bringing people together differently and fostering connection in, in a different way? Um, what are you seeing? What are people telling you are the benefits that perhaps they didn't anticipate but are experiencing from this model? Yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it ironic that our society is more connected digitally than mm. ever? And yet we are lonelier than ever. And maybe it's because of our digital connectedness, actually, that we are lonely. You know, mm. We're a species that evolved in in-person settings. Mm -hmm. And so while on all of my social media cha channels, I am preaching and raving about distributed and remote work, mostly because I believe people deserve to have freedom in their lives. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I keep harping on is that remote work doesn't need to mean that it's lonely work. Yes. And that we confuse remote work with isolation a lot because we equate remote work with working from home. Again, because mm -hmm. the pandemic forced remote mm -hmm. work to be synonymous with working from home. But post pandemic, there are countless ways to work remotely, including working from home, but also in a park, in a coffee shop, in a radius space, etc. Remote work, I just see as a, an, an umbrella term that encompasses yeah so many ways to to work and that the office is not the only place to be together and it's not the only place upon which we should have social connection and this yeah. is one of the things that i think there was i had the sense as companies added daycares and dry cleaning and fitness and everything into the workspace that mm -hmm. there was almost a boy, if we can get everybody to believe they can have everything here, they never need to leave. I mean, what do we have? What do we have Elon Musk giving people the right to stay at the, you know, or mm -hmm. I, I forget what company it was, but the right to stay, maybe it was even Apple, um, stay at a hotel, you know, we'll pay for the hotel. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, oh, you know, there's more to life than work. And yeah. I've come up with a term for this shrinking belief and shrinking, being in touch with the other elements of life that can exist and need to exist, workplace myopia, that we just always see as work. And I've seen this with burnout and overwork is that people forget how to fun. They have forget friends. They forget all of these other areas, which if you were to design a life before you started working in the corporate world and say, what should be in it? It would be a very full picture. Mm -hmm. And then it just shrinks. Maybe even it starts with school as people have to really focus and so much is demanded of us to to narrow our our vision and focus on something we we for years start to weed out what's really important and the fact yeah. that we do not stay in the same place largely now you're no longer where you grew up mm -hmm. um so we don't have family supports around us we actually need to make more of an effort to build that local community yes and does yes. radius have a, a perspective on that Oh, immensely. And 
So first of all, first of all, let me just say that, you know, just like you said that you can't unsee the freedom that you felt when the pandemic forced us to work remotely. We also can't unsee the parts of our lives that were given back to us. More time with family, more time for self-development and hobbies and becoming well-rounded humans inside and outside of work. Mm -hmm. We can't unsee that. And that is one of the biggest reasons I am excited for this movement is because we get to be happier, more fulfilled humans. Who wouldn't want that? I mean, it's good for business, sure, but it's just good for humanity. So come on, let's do this yeah. thing. Well, I, I kind of hope for a, a vision of success which and contribution, which measures human contribution beyond work productivity. But what about the com- con- contribution to raising the next generation, to taking care of our elders, to nurturing the environment? We have responsibilities as humans that go beyond work. And if work and the social responsibility piece is going to be really serious, do we not have to look at human productivity more holistically than just on the job? Absolutely. We absolutely do. And and to answer your question about community, I th- think this is critically important and exciting, the opportunity we have ahead. So at its core, Radius is about neighbors booking neighbors' homes for the purpose of work, right? Because we are a marketplace that is similar in concept to Airbnb, where we work with residential properties, but Mm -hmm. no overnight stays. It's just about booking that house, that apartment, that guest house in your neighbor's backyard for your work day, right? It's outfitted with a whiteboard, with a sit-stand desk, with maybe a meeting table, with AV, all of the amenities that you would expect at an office or a conference room, but with all the comforts of home. And by booking a workspace that's right in your neighborhood, now all of a sudden you have an excuse to talk to somebody in your neighborhood that maybe you have only ever passed by while you were walking your dogs and politely nodded at them as you continued on your way. And now you're talking about the door code and the Wi-Fi password and very innocuous things that end up being a foot in the door, perhaps literally, to starting a relationship with somebody that's in your community that otherwise you may have never talked to before. And in a world where we are epidemically lonely, what better than connecting with your immediate community and bonding over collaboration? I am tremendously excited to be building a platform that brings people together in this way. I'm excited about it too. That's what drew me to you right away. I thought, oh, this local connection piece is something that we're sorely missing and needs to be played up. So I was, yeah, like I said, very, very thrilled to discover you. Tell listeners out there a little bit more then about where you're operating now. So where people could find a radius space uh, as you're in the early stages, I will say, of what I expect to be a very, um, very big opportune opportunity for, uh, for the U.S. and beyond. So tell us where you are right now. So the quick answer is that we are all across the United States. You need a space anywhere in the US, we will find it for you. The more elaborate answer is that there are three main cities that we officially operate out of. Portland, Oregon, where we started, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we expanded to next, and we just recently announced our expansion into the Bay Area we ha- where we have a beautiful catalog that's growing. But we also have what we're calling a national concierge service, because a lot of the companies that we work with, while they might have employees in Portland or in the Bay Area, so many companies are hiring in a distributed fashion these days. These are the times, right? And so they might have a cluster of five or 10 people, perhaps in Chicago or in New York or in St. Louis, big cities, small cities, and everywhere in between. And so... 
because we have a growing waiting list of properties that are excited to host with us, but maybe outside the geographies that we officially serve, they're waiting in the wings and they have beautiful properties and they're excited to get going with us. And so, you know, just recently we responded to demand uh, in Santa Monica. There was a company that needed to do a meeting with their team for 20 people and they wanted to be beachfront. Mm -hmm. And so they gave us about two weeks notice or so. And we ended up tapping into our network of secret spaces. And we were able to get them a list of, I believe it was close to five spaces to choose from. And they ended up booking one that was just gorgeous and served all of their needs. And Mm -hmm. it was, you know, they reported back that it was so much more inspiring than then their only other option really was to book a hotel conference room, which would have been devoid of windows, no natural light. Yes. It would have just been a dark room. And, yeah. you know, the whole point of it was team building and insp- inspiration. You got to have some soul. You got to have some soul and hopefully some nature to go with that, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. We're not inter- interested in factory replicable experiences. We need something novel. And I think that's what Radius hits on too with the variety and the options is the mm-hmm. desire for novelty and to be inspired by where you are. So yeah. if an organization is hearing this and thinking, or if a listener is hearing this and saying, I have a space, this would be so great. Um, mm-hmm. What would they do? What would next steps be for them to become a secret space with you? Or potentially if you're in Milwaukee or Portland or the Bay Area to, to actually join yep. your network? Yep. Connect with me on LinkedIn or shoot me an email or simply go to our website, radius.pro. And there is a button to become a host. And there's all kinds of information and resources on how to get started. But we also have a small but mighty host success team. And they are hosts themselves on on Radius and on uh, various other platforms, actually, too. And uh, and we can help build the listing and also assess whether your property uh, would work on the platform and help mm. you uh, perhaps uh, make, uh, make some small revisions to it to really make it stand out. Mm. What kinds of things do you think make a property stand out then? You know, the number one requested amenity Mm. is a whiteboard. And that is really great news for homeowners because having a whiteboard, say in your dining room, instantly turns that room into a collaborative brainstorm space. Mm -hmm. And it's good. A whiteboard or a just a... Markers. Just an an analog one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be one on an easel. It could be on a rolling stand. It could be whiteboard paint. It Mm -hmm. could be something that you hang on your wall. I gave my son a plastic sheet to put on the wall and it it became a whiteboard. Exactly. Right. There are so many creative ways to do it. You can rent out... (laughs) There you go. Absolutely. It doesn't take that's the, and that's the beauty of it is that mm-hmm. you don't have to transform your home in any way. In fact, what companies love about this concept is that the spaces do feel homey. Yeah. And so if you have a dining room that seats four, six, eight, ten people, mm-hmm. you advertise a space as how many people can fit and mm-hmm. what amenities you have, something like a, a $15 HDMI cable. Mm-hmm. now means that people can plug their laptops into your TV and now your living room is a presentation space. Again, it doesn't take take much. 50 bucks on a whiteboard, $15 yeah. on an HDMI cable, and now your house is a conference space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we were, we're looking for that. People like the home. We saw an evolution in office design to have more loungy spaces in mm-hmm. the workspace. So yep. I think that's touching on the fact we want to be comfortable, I think is really what it's, what it comes down to. When you say there's no overnights, what are are there restricted hours then for the office day? Each host will set their listing slightly differently, Mm -hmm. but for the most part, you can count on it being nine to five, eight to six. Some of our hosts have it set seven to seven and even beyond some of them accommodate for those people who might have meetings with other time zones. And so they might need something yeah. late into the night or yeah. early in the morning. Uh, but these are all search filters on our platform. And so if you need a certain check-in or check-out time, you can filter search results by that and also by amenity type. So you're only seeing search results that match your needs. Yeah. 
I love it. I think that's, uh, I think it's going to have great success because I think people will, as they learn about it, will be, oh my gosh, this is exactly what we need. And you made it easy to connect to. I know even here looking for available meeting space was a go to my speaking network. What have you found? What have you, you know, to look it in and find it as a search, um, not that many options and mm. um, not very interesting options. But uh, hopefully this is this is changing um, that. What else would you like to say to people who are thinking about um, making options more available to their workforce? Um, what, what else would you say to your potential customers who are listening right now? Yeah, you know, the biggest thing that comes to mind is to really make it a collaborative process with your people. Listen to them. And listen to them not just because it checks a box and it makes people feel heard, but listen to them because they really have valuable things to add. And if you then go ahead and create a workplace policy that encompasses their feedback, but maybe not wholly, because look, you can't ever please everyone. There's always gonna be somebody that's disappointed by what you've created in a policy. I think it's important to have transparency into how the decision was made. Mm -hmm. We considered this perspective, this perspective, this perspective. Ultimately, we felt that this, this, and this worked. We'd like to experiment with such and such, but we recognize that these things are always best as an iterative process. So we're going to test it and get feedback and continue to listen to you and make revisions as we go. How does that sound? Mm -hmm. I think that is a much more collaborative and effective way to move forward than just saying, all right, thank you for your survey responses. And then a month later saying, all right, here's what we're doing. Yes. Oh my gosh. Because then yes. nobody actually has any clarity as to whether their input had any value whatsoever or whether it was just lip service. All right, we're going to pretend to listen to you, but we're just going to do what we were going to do all along anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels, uh, yeah, exactly. Like you said, like lip service or a veneer, somebody, <laughs> somebody used the term veneer the other day. And I think tr people need to be heard. They need to be considered and it needs to be a genuine, thoughtful um, thing to do. Once you get it right, or you get a list of uh, places that can grow, that will, can probably change over time as people do different things with their spaces. But um, I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity, again, to provide the options that people are looking for now. And mm -hmm. so radius.pro, that's where people can find you. And Amina right. Moreau on LinkedIn, we'll put all of those uh, links in the chat and or not in the chat in our show notes so you can find them for sure and uh, as always I invite you if you've been listening to this podcast please reach out on social media because we'll be posting this and tagging Amina and uh, let us know what you thought I'm sure Amina you'd love to hear from your clients right always yeah. always and that's that's the thing about building a startup right it truly takes a village and it takes honest feedback good and bad to really understand what people need so the more the merrier yeah so tell them you know what you would look for in a space and where you would like it and maybe it'll get onto that secret spaces list and maybe then you'll find yourself in a radius space with other people and building up a local community uh, Amina, I uh, just want to congratulate you on a brilliant idea and wish you all the best success and uh, and congratulations on bringing people together and thinking about our environment at the same time. Thank you. You can find all of the Happy Space Podcast episodes over at happyspacepod.com. I love learning what resonates with you, so please leave a comment about this episode over social media, or even better, post a review wherever you tune in. And if you have an idea for a topic to explore or an inclusive action to celebrate, I would love to know more about it. It might even appear in an upcoming episode or an issue of the Happy Space newsletter. Please help me spread the word about people doing great things. After all, doesn't everyone deserve a happy space? Thank you.